Okay, we're back again for one more week of See You in the Cosmos. Today I'll be reading uh, the fifth chapter, new recording number five. Here we go. New recording five, eight minutes, 52 seconds. Okay, let me try this again. I wanted to tell you what happened at the train station before, but I was crying and I wasn't making any sense, so I deleted it. Ronnie used to tell me to man up whenever he saw me cry. He'd tell me to stop crying. Nobody likes to cry, baby. And I try, but I can't help it sometimes. Sometimes the clouds inside my head get big and gray and swirly, and then I hurricane through my eyes. Except I don't literally hurricane through my eyes. I don't, have an, I, I don't actually have a weather system in my head. This morning... Just when Carl Sagan and I were about to leave, I realized that I packed too much stuff, even with my two-in-one shampoo conditioner. I tried, carrying it I tried carrying it all, and it was so heavy. I could barely even make it five steps before I got tired. It didn't look that heavy last night, and everything by itself wasn't heavy, but it really adds up. I said to Carl Sagan, what do we do now? And he looked at me like, why are you asking me? And then I tried putting my duffel bag on his back and he squirmed away and he was like, what do you think I am, a donkey? I told him I know he's not a donkey, but then I had a great idea. My idea was to go in our garage and get the wagon that I used for buying groceries. And I put everything in the wagon and it fit, problem solved. Then I knocked softly on my mom's door to see if she was awake yet, but she wasn't. So I went up to her bed and I whispered in her ear, we're leaving now, we'll be back on Sunday, like I said, and I love you just in case she couldn't hear me in her dreams. Carl Sagan and I walked down our street, and we turned left at Justin Mendoza's house. We walked along Mill Road, and I was pulling my wagon with one hand, and I had Carl Sagan's leash in my other hand, and we went past Mr. Bashir's gas station and the Super 8 Motel right next to it. I wanted to say hello and goodbye to Mr. Bashir, but I didn't want to be late. And also, I was worried that the Amtrak people might not let me bring my wagon on the train. But I wasn't crying yet. That didn't happen until later. We got to the Amtrak station 15 minutes before the train was supposed to get there. I showed the ticket guy my e-ticket, and he asked me, where are my parents? And I said, it's just me and Carl Sagan. He asked me, where's, where's Carl Sagan? And I, and I moved to the right because Carl Sagan was hiding behind my legs. The ticket guy looked at me and he said, this is an adult ticket. And I said, yeah, because the website only let me buy an adult ticket. He said that I need the children's ticket, and I asked him how can I get one, he said I need to buy it with an adult ticket, and I was really confused. He said I can't get on the train by myself. I need to have an adult with me if I'm younger than 13. Then he asked to see my ID, and I showed him my Planetary Society membership card, and he says he needs an ID with a birthday on it, and so I showed him my school ID. And that's how he found out I'm not 13 yet. I told him I'm more responsible than a lot of 13-year-olds I know. I said I'm more responsible than even a lot of 14-year-olds. But he said it doesn't matter. The only thing that matters is your real age. And I said that's really stupid because kids are different. They should give everyone a test to see how responsible they are and then give them a responsibility age. I know I'd be at least 13 then because I can already cook and take care of a dog. I didn't say anything about the responsibility test to the ticket guy, though. I just thought about how I had all my stuff and Carl Sagan's stuff and Carl Sagan, too. And I really didn't want to miss Sharp, so I sat down on one of the chairs in the station and I started crying. Carl Sagan started crying too because he cries whenever I cry. And then I thought maybe it's better if I don't go to Sharp. Maybe it's better if I stay in Rockview because I've never been away from home without my mom or Ronnie before. And if I stay here, that means I'll have more time to make recordings for you guys. And then when I have enough sounds from Earth, I can launch Voyager 3 on my own. I don't have to do it at Sharp, even though I spent all that money on my train ticket and on registration, and now I won't get to meet Europa or Calexico or anyone else from Rocket Forum. And that's when I got out my golden iPod and tried telling you guys what happened, but it just, just came out as a bunch of crying. And I heard the horn from the train coming, and I cried even harder. I didn't think I was ever going to stop. But then I heard someone say, what's the matter? And I looked up and it was this older kid, and he was wearing a blue bandana on his head. And he had a huge backpack that was even bigger than I was. It was so huge. The older kid sat down next to me, and it took me a while to tell him everything. 
I had to stop hur- hurricaning before I made any sense. I calmed down finally to just scattered showers, and I told him I'm supposed to go to Sharf to launch my golden iPod into space, and all my friends from rocketforum.org are going to be there, and I spent a fortune on the train ticket, and I made food for my mom and put the Gladware in the refrigerator, and now there's no way I can go because I'm not 13, even though I'm at least 13 in responsibility years. He said, this sounds like it's really important to you. And I said, of course it's important. If it wasn't important, I wouldn't be crying, duh. Except I didn't say that last part. I just nodded. I'm complicated. He asked to see my ticket, and I showed it to him. I showed him my duffel bag with my rocket and my registration email, my Google Maps printout of the Sharp site, and even my 2-in-1 shampoo conditioner. I don't know why I showed him that. He asked me, where are my parents? And I told him, my dad died when I was really little, and my mom's at home, and she doesn't really care what I do as long as I don't bother her too much. He said, man, you're starting this early, aren't you? And I said, huh? Starting what early? And then he gave me back my folder, and he told me that no matter what, just follow his lead and nod along to whatever he says, and I nodded. He got in line, so I got in line too. And we, when we got up to the ticket guy, the ticket guy looked at him, and he looked at me, and he asked the older kid, is he with you? And, I, and the kid said, yeah, he's my stepbrother. He said, I leave to go to the bathroom one minute, and Alex tries to ditch me at the station. Some brother, huh? The ticket guy looked at me and asked me, is he your brother? And I looked at the kid and then back at the ticket guy and I nodded. And the ticket guy said, next time, stay with your brother, okay? And I nodded again. Then he scanned our tickets and he gave us our seat numbers. The older kid helped me carry my wagon onto the train. And there's an upstairs level and a downstairs level and our seats were upstairs. We had to walk through a bunch of the train's cars to get to the pet-friendly car. And between the cars, they have these metal doors with big rectangular buttons on them that when you push the button, the door slides open automatically and it goes like on a spaceship. It's so cool. I wish I had those for my house. There weren't as many people on the train as I thought, though. Probably half the seats were empty. And I guess it was still pretty early in the morning because I saw old people and families with little kids and most of them were sleeping, except this bald guy who was wearing gray robes like a martial arts master. When we passed the seat, he smiled at me, and I bowed, and I said, Namaste, which is how you're supposed to greet martial arts masters. I'm here in the pet-friendly car now, and Carl Sagan's curled into a donut on the seat next to mine. The older kid isn't here with us anymore, though. He moved because he's kind of allergic to cats. I said, shouldn't you sit in the seat number that the ticket guy gave you? And he said that they usually don't care. He said, if anyone asks me, am I by myself, or gives me trouble, just come find him. And I said, thank you for pretending to be my adult. He said, no problem. I hope you find what you're looking for. And I told him, I'm not looking for anything. I'm launching a rocket, remember? And the kid laughed and said, that's right. And then he laughed and, oh, duh. I bet he was talking about the sounds from Earth I want to record for you guys. That's what he hopes I. Hey, maybe the older kid has a girlfriend and he can be my man in love. I'm going to go find him later and ask him. And that was recording number five from See You in the Cosmos. Um, So now Alex's journey is really beginning. He's managed to get aboard the train uh, on the way to Sharp. Uh, And so next week, we'll come back again for recording six and find out what happens to Alex on the train.